There's a rule that I've discovered over the years that is really solid for telling when something is going to work and when it won't. And it goes like this. Things that are going to work really well work even when they're poorly designed. So I'll give you an example. Cool. All right, guys, welcome back to Growth Minds. This is going to be our first time doing a Skype remote interview. Missed all the madness that is happening. And we've got a great guest on here today for you guys. He's the creator of Dilbert. Uh, and he's got three of some of the best-selling books that are out there that we're going to dig into today. His name is Scott Adams, coming in from California, I believe, right? That's right. That's okay. right. I won't go any specific than that, but uh, thanks so much for for joining us and um yeah how how has everything been going amidst all the amidst all this madness i guess on the sh on the shutdown are you usually more of a person that is pretty extroverted you like to go out often or is this is this kind of like a, a new thing for you uh, i'm actually an introvert by nature who has uh, learned to be extroverted when i need to you know to get something done so yeah. i can i can operate in that extrovert world if i need to but i got to say I'm pretty comfortable spending a lot of time alone, uh, but this is too much because I'm I can't even spend time with my own fiance at this point, so that's oh, pretty rough. I mean, I I was actually planning to get married in May, no and way. instead it'll be it'll be two or three months without even being able to see your your well see I can see her from a distance, but I, you know to not actually be together. Wow. Okay. So how does that work? Are you guys just going to? Was that a, we have separate to be a homes. big wedding? Okay. Yeah, she has, she has a home that's walking distance, so uh, she's down the road. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I'm definitely more of an ambivert myself. I think um, I enjoy the the kind of the time alone, but yeah, this is this is a little bit too much for sure. I mean, I'm definitely getting a little loopy. But they said that the some of the best artistic work, some of the best uh, music were, was created during these, this time of self-isolation. I don't know if there's a lot of people that are doing some great work right now, but I'm certainly, <laughs> I don't know if I can put my hand up here in this case. Well, you know, what's interesting is that uh, early in my career, when I was in, uh, you know, sort of my, my early stage of my life, uh, my social life was so bad. You know, I'd come to California. I didn't have family here. You know, wasn't really successful dating, didn't have any real friends, you know, at least many of them. And I would spend just massive amounts of time alone. And so I tried to learn to code, and that's where Dilbert was born. And uh, I, I'm positive that the immense amount of alone time allowed me to develop some creative muscles that I would not have otherwise. So I do mm. think that that was, you know, accidentally part of the success. Interesting, interesting. Where if, were you more of an extroverted growing up, and you? because of this alone time that you had, you've kind of transitioned more into an introvert? No, I've, I've always been an introvert by nature. It's only when I became famous through Dilbert that I forced myself to learn how to speak in crowds and you know be comfortable in, in all these other social situations. So I'm quite comfortable in all of those situations, but it's a, a learned skill in my case. Sure, sure. Yeah, just like anything. I mean, you're a great public speaker, so goes a lot to say that a lot of people can can learn skills that they haven't developed. So that's um, that's a great example to to share for sure. You know, it's interesting that you can be an introvert and a ham at the same time. So you could be an yeah. introvert and a sh and a show off, and it and there's no no conflict there. In fact, there are a lot of uh, famous actors who will tell you they're introverted, but they just like acting. So I, I think I'm one of those. Is there an opposite scenario where that would happen, where they're extroverted, but they can – actually, no, that probably wouldn't work, right? They're extroverted. Yeah, I don't know but, what the opposite is. Well, like I said, yeah. extroverted, and uh, they would try to act shy, but you know, that, that's probably easier to do than the other way around, for sure. Yeah, I think the extrovert, uh, the opposite would be spending a lot of time alone, and I don't think that they can learn that. I, I'm I don't sure know if people are going crazy can, right now. The extroverted yeah, people are. Yeah, I don't know if you could learn to you know spend an hour alone meditating. It'd be, it'd be worth trying. I mean, this would be a good time to test it if you wanted to. Yeah, I mean, I I, I would say I was I definitely grew up as an extrovert, and I did this silent meditation trip in uh, Hawaii called Vipassana, 
and uh, it drove me crazy, but it, it, I definitely changed after a while. But that's similar to this experience. You're kind of like deep diving deep into the deep pool and you're just kind of forcing yourself. And I'm sure a lot of people are so socially are going to come out quite different from this. A lot of extroverted people that we know are, I'm sure, going to become a little bit more ambivert, uh, you know, in the next next couple of years. You know, it's even better than that. I like to to focus on the the positive, and it's hard to see any positive when you're in the middle of you know death and and pain and misery and economic meltdown. But one of the things that's happening, you could have never imagined could have happened, which is that suddenly everybody in the world at the same time started questioning every part of their own being and every system that exists on Earth from your work, to how do you commute, how do you go to school, how do you go to church? Literally, everybody is thinking about everything as if it's new. We, we all just said, okay, what what if this had never existed before? If I were going to build it today, how would I build it today? And society has this one sort of uh, cyclical problem, which is that you know it, it builds up to something good, and then it gets ossified, like you know, the, it gets a little stuck because you don't want to break something that's working pretty well. But when everything falls apart, then the risk reward changes and you say to yourself, well, it already fell apart. So now that it fell apart, what would be the smarter way to put it back together again if I'm going to build it from scratch? So of course, nobody, nobody would wish this kind of a problem on the world, but here it is. And if you look at you know, the, the amount of innovation that comes out of say World War II or even Vietnam, you know, whenever there's a giant challenge, uh, all the smartest people go into hyperdrive and they work together and they solve problems that you never thought could be solved before. And suddenly you've got radar and all these things that have you know, widespread application in the real world. I, I think that this has some gigantic social benefits that are invisible to us at this point. And it's really just the combination of focus and creativity and our risk management changed and everybody's looking at it new. Um, mm. you know, let's just start, start fresh. What would you do if, if you started today and how, when else does society get a chance like that? You know, short of an actual war. I don't know. Does it ever happen? I can't think of one time we all got to think about everything, like just everything in your example of how even individuals are rewiring their own brains because if you take an extrovert who learns through practice to be, you know, how to quiet themselves and how to have some alone time, that's really changing your brain. So people uh, are taking this time to rewire fundamentally who they are. Even their preferences are changing. And when your preferences change, uh, I argue that you're a new person. Because if you could say, what's the one thing that defines who you are? Well, it's not your arms and legs. Because you could lose those in an accident, you'd still be you. It's not, um, in some ways, it's not what you've learned, because you're still you if you haven't learned anything. And you could go down the list, and everything seems a little bit optional, except your preferences. Uh, that's the most, you know, stable part of who you are, and even that changes. And the point being that people are going to change their preferences after this. So there are things that I used to think I needed that I'm looking at now and I'm saying, you know, I liked it, but I don't need it. What are some of those things you know, for you? Well, here's one that occurred to me prior to the uh, the shutdown, which is I, I stopped drinking alcohol just because I started getting an allergic reaction to it. Mm -hmm. Now, if you'd asked me, if you'd asked me before that, is, is not drinking a good thing, I'd say, are you kidding? You know, I just do it on weekends. You know, I don't overdo it. It's a good social thing. Of course it's good. It relaxes me. Sure, it's not the best thing in the world. But then you stop for a while for other reasons. I didn't really choose it. It chose me. And I look back at it and I go, I can't believe I did that for so long because mm. it's just poison. And it turns out that my social life was really a bunch of people who were functional alcoholics who had found a way to spend time with each other so they didn't look like alcoholics. Mm. You know, they, they turned it into a, a social masquerade for the fact that they were going to drink anyway. <laughs> so you might as well have your friends around. So it completely redefined who I was as well as my priorities and my preferences. So, you know, if you do enough of that, you're you're almost a different person. I think people will emerge 
pretty fundamentally different after they rethink who they are and what, what matters and what they care about. It's a great point. I mean, just given how much negativity there is in the media, I mean, this is a hugely positive point that I, I think few people really talk about, which is the upside in this time of isolation. As you mentioned, you are really the, the five people that you surround yourself with and living in you know, the, the world, it seems like a world apart when we can talk to people and touch, touch people and, and go to bars and stuff and you can surround yourself with people physically, uh, it really helps, it really melds into the way you are. And I think most people are not hang, probably hanging out with at least one person that's not healthy for them. At least one person, right? I think most people are. I would say right. most people. And uh, the opportunity of this isolation is that, yeah, most people kind of have to face who they are and their own internal thoughts. And they can kind of discover who they really are and what their real thoughts are because there's really nowhere else to go. And I think a lot of positivity yeah. is going to come for that. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, was it Tim Ferriss who made that observation first that you are the average of your five, the five people you spend time with? Was I he think the one he was who made quoting that? Brian Tracy or someone else, but he popularized okay. that, I'm sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, probably popularized. Um, but that, that point is really strong because, to your point, if you take away the five people, which happened to most of us because it's not who you're, you're quarantined with, uh, then you're on your own. What happens when you're on your own to make your own personality? Because we haven't had to do that. We're we're the the average of the friends, and it's just some you know some of some of things beyond our control. But now now you have control. You get to reinvent yourself. And who are you? Now I, I have uh, maybe more of an opportunity in a bad way than most people because I think my occupation is probably over. Because newspapers, I don't think, are going to survive the next six months. So, so I have to basically find a new job, effectively. Mm -hmm. I mean, not right away. I mean, it'll take a while for them to, you know, trail off. But I'm already thinking, okay, who am I now? And so I'm spending this time exactly under this, this. You know, I'm I'm not worried about you know being able to eat. I've done well, but I still have to reinvent myself because when I get to go back to work or society goes back to whatever is normal-ish. I've got to figure out what that looks like for the next five or 10 years. And I, know, I didn't think I'd have to do that. And I have mixed feelings about it. Because again, if, if I had to choose, I would say, no, don't change anything. I, I just like my steady little job. I know how to do it. It pays well. But then it changes probably. I mean, I'm still waiting to see the outcome. But I think newspapers will mostly fail. Um, and I actually find myself a little bit excited about it. It, it feels it feels a little bit like being reborn, you know. When you re, you reach my age, I'll, I'll be sixty three in, in a, a month or so, and you don't really think you get to do new stuff forever. You know, you reach a point you get where you say, okay, I did all the the interesting, new, creative, dangerous stuff I'm going to do now. Now I need to just take it easy and and ride this success, you know, coast and, and coast. So my ability to coast just got taken from me. Mm. You know, I wouldn't choose it, but I got to say it's exciting. It's actually exciting. And I find I find it stimulating me to think in ways I wouldn't have thought to consider things to, you know, modify my risk management. It's like oh, I wouldn't normally do that, but I guess I could take a chance now. So it's weirdly stimulating and I feel bad about it because, you know, 95 percent of the world is having a tough, tough time right now. Yeah. Uh, but there will be positives that come out of it. If, and I don't think anybody's going to starve in this country until we get to that better time. No, I don't think so. And congrats to you. Good for you for for, yeah, for at least starting this new chapter in your life and also having that mindset to know that I think a lot of people may have looked at it as like, oh, man, I have to start over again. But hearing the tone of your voice and things that you're planning, it sounds like you're really enthusiastic and you're, you're kind of like almost like giddy about this opportunity that you don't know what's going to happen and it's it's kind of making you feel like a kid i'm sure again right or a kid or an entrepreneur because i use this example if if you said to an entrepreneur entrepreneur all right i'm going to take this environment and let's let's imagine it's a box with stuff in it and i'm just going to shake the heck out of this box mm. do you want me to do that now the entrepreneur is going to say yeah give it a shake give it a shake 
because I'm going to find some combinations. I'm going to see an opportunity after you shake the box. It's the box that's not shaken that I don't like because mm. I, I want things to be broken so I can find the way to fix them. That's, that's my business. So I think if you've got sort of a natural entrepreneurial um, you know, vein in your, in your personality, that at least that part is excited, even if you're afraid of you know, what might happen. I'd actually be curious to dig into more if you're comfortable talking about it. What are some of the ways? How are some of the ways you think about or frameworks you use to decide what this new chapter would be in your life? I think a lot of people can benefit from it because I'm sure most people are starting out new. A lot of people lost their jobs. A lot of people are going to transition. I imagine from employees to freelancers or freelancers to business owners in this time and age in the next five years. Right. So for someone like yourself. You know, what are some of the frameworks you use to decide or to go into this new project of yours? Uh, do you kind of, uh, you know, do you kind of demolish the things that you th you've been known for in the past? Do you just want to start completely new or do you want to use that as a competitive advantage in some ways? How, do, how are some other ways? Well, so everybody's going to be different, but I'll, I'll give you my sort of foundational uh, the first thing I do is I say, which business models would I want to be associated with? And the, the general choice you have to make is do you want to sell your time or do you want to sell something that could be reproduced in infinite amounts so you can just sort of invent it once and then it can be sold to the moon? Um, and, and if you're going to sell stuff, do you want to sell lots of little things? Or do you want to be in a business where you're going to sell an airplane or a, or a work of art you know, for millions of dollars? So there are certainly some business models that are better than others. The one that fits my personality and talent stack and, and everything else uh, is creating things that can be reproduced. So whether I'm creating a comic strip that can be made, uh, you know, a TV show, uh, lately, I'm doing mostly podcasts and live streams. They can all be reproduced forever. And so I look at what's my competitive advantage. You know, what's the thing I can do that other people can't as easily match? And creativity and communication are largely the things that I have some kind of advantage in because I've, over the years, I've combined enough skills to, to build that unique talent. So, so the first thing I'm going to look at is what's a good business model and that fits what I know and what I can do. Then I'm going to look at my what I call my talent stack. I write about this in my book, How to Fail Almost Everything and Still Win Big. And it, that, that uh, refers to intelligently combining skills so that you're not just learning more, you're learning things that fit together well. So uh, the classic example is if you're good at whatever you're doing at your workplace – but you add on top of that the ability to be a good public speaker. Just mm. take one example of one skill. If you stack that on top of what you already know, well, who is your boss's boss going to look to when it's time to replace the boss? Like who, who has leadership skills plus also understands the department because you do the work? Well, it's going to be the person who learned how to do public speaking. Mm. You know, that's not the only requirement, but you can see how quickly just adding a fairly ordinary skill – because I've never met anybody who couldn't get a lot better at public speaking just by taking a class. You know, I've been in a number of classes, different types. Some are better than others. But you do observe that everybody in the class is way better at the end of the class. And I'm not talking about going to school for a semester. I'm talking about something you could do in a week, a few days, a couple of weeks, you know, that, that sort of thing. So there are a lot of skills you don't need to go to college for. You can just sort of pick them up and, and combine them. So then the, the next thing I say is what are, what's in my stack and what could I add to it in, a, in an effective way that's practical that would make it more valuable, that better fits this new environment? And in my case, the answer came down to I need um, video skills because we're sort of a video YouTube world. And if I want to play in that in that box, I've got to learn, you know, a couple new things. So I spent a great deal of time learning the, the technology, uh, the lighting, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, th there's a whole bunch of sub skills, which, you know, you had to do the same thing to do this podcast. You had to learn, all right, there are 1 million ways to do sound. There are 1 million ways to record or 1 million ways to do the interview and they don't all work well. <laughs> <And> you've got to, <laughs> 
<laughs> and you've got to like you've got to try them all, find out for yourself. You know, and I see you're wearing the the Apple uh, earbuds, and it took me I don't know months and months and months until I realized, wait a minute, I'll bet these earbuds have pretty good quality. And I tried them out, and sure enough, they're great. Right, and obviously you know that you're wearing them. So even the, and they work as a microphone if you're not in a in a studio situation as well. So all of these little uh, micro skills about um, how to present yourself on camera, which by the way people comment um, all the time about my my live streaming, let's say personality, and that takes a lot of work because there's nobody who's really comfortable automatically on camera. Uh, as evidence, I would say, look at Joe Biden doing his live streams from his basement. <laughs> <Here's> <laughs> one, uh, one of the most experienced politicians of all time, by by every measure, one of the best retail handshaking, pat you on the back politicians of all time. So he's got the base skills of of the top top level politician, but you put a camera in front of him and no audience, and he just disappears. Because he doesn't know how to, he doesn't know how to quite modify to what it takes. Now, when I started doing the the periscopes, for example, I had the same problem because I felt like I was um, presenting to an audience, and I would talk to the camera like I was presenting. It's like, well, you've got to do this, and you've got to do this, and it would look sort of stilted and artificial. Uh, but because Periscope, the, the one that I use, has comments that are flowing and it's live and, and it's interactive and I'm answering the comments and stuff, I soon sort of evolved into a personality that's almost indistinguishable from in person. Mm. And if you think you could pull that off on day one, because I think I make it look easy because it just looks like I'm talking like I'm talking to a person. And by the way, the way I'm talking to you now is identical the way I would talk to you if you were it's sitting at the natural. table. Yeah, yeah there's, there's no difference. But you can't do that the first time you try. And, and you know, especially if you know that there are lots of people watching. It's a little easier one-on-one because you know, maybe you've done enough FaceTime calls that you're, you're used to one-on-one. But if you know there's a whole bunch of people out there and you can't see them and you're just presenting, you sort of automatically get into presenter head. Mm. which is just not as interesting. And so, all right, this is all by way of saying there are a whole bunch of micro skills that I had to accomplish to just be able to have a, you know, a podcast and a live stream that people would watch. So that's what I'm doing, just compiling skills technically in every other way. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's actually one of my favorite books. I, I recommend it to as many people as I can. I've, I've even talked about it a few times. Uh, we've had some really big YouTubers that have gone on to to check out your book, How to Win Big, uh, How to stay, How to Fail at Everything but Still Win Big, which is primarily the the key point that I took from it was this idea of kill, uh, career skill stacking, where you take two to three skills that you can uh, combine to become world class versus becoming one percent at one skill, like the LeBron James of the world, the Warren Buffett, which is impossible for most people. And it's so relevant because there's so many resources and books that are out there. You've got the Michael Porters, uh, you've got uh, all these textbooks that are talking about competitive advantages you can find in the business world. But in this world where we're entering into like a you incorporated, which is everyone is their own business, everyone is their own brand, and you can really make a great business. Like you look at yourself, the, the Joe Rogans of the world. Uh, it's it, there's not a lot of resources, or at least they haven't been until this book that I found, uh, which is which is what you wrote, and it's incredibly relevant because it teaches how you as an individual can gain some sort of a sustainable competitive advantage. And I like to talk about this uh, framework that you have, which is the idea that systems will always beat goals. Uh, can you dig into a little bit more about that in terms of how people can actually develop some of these skill sets that you you put out? Yeah, so I often say that systems are better than goals. And the way I define it is a goal is something very specific that you want. So you might say, my goal is to have my boss's job in three years. Now, the problem with having goals is that there might be other things that are just as good for you. But if you focus too much and it's just the one thing you want – and what are you doing to get there? You might not have a plan to get there. You just got a goal. So a better way to go is systems. Now, a system is something that you're doing every day 
that prepares you generally. So in other words, uh, going to college, let's say getting a, an English degree is a system because you don't know what job that's going to prepare you for, but you know it prepares you for lots of things. You might have to add some skills on top of that when you get to the workforce, probably do, but, uh, but that's a good system. Another system is learning to eat right. I'll give you an example. So if you eat right, you're going to be healthier. It's easier to exercise. You won't feel so bad going to the gym. If your weight looks good, you know, you won't be self-conscious. So there's this whole, um, ripple effect of goodness that you get from just eating right. You know, it helps your social life. You'll get more promotions. If you, you know, unfortunately people's appearance does affect everything, you know, how they're treated in the workplace, whether you buy from them, everything. So a system to get your eating right, I recommend, is to take a lifetime approach instead of going on a diet. Take a lifetime approach in which you're simply trying to learn as much as you can about which foods are good for you. And, and then on top of that, how to prepare those foods. So it's one thing to say, okay, a, uh, a sweet potato is better than a, re a russet potato. It's like, okay, I learned something, but now I don't want to eat the sweet potato. So it didn't help me. So I got I to learn the extra thing, which is, all right, how would I prepare this so I wouldn't want to eat it? In my case, I like putting soy sauce and pepper on it, and it's delicious. Now, it took a lot of experimenting to, to build a system in which uh, over time, little by little, I've learned how to make foods that normally would not taste great taste amazing. I'll, I'll give you like a really clean example. If I said, here's some cauliflower. Hey, eat, eat this cauliflower. And you'd be like, eh, you know, I could boil it, it'd be all right. You know, maybe if I put some soy sauce on it, it wouldn't be too bad. But try this trick. Take a cauliflower, just a raw cauliflower, and slice it thin so that you've got like a little, almost like a chip of a cauliflower. And then uh, salt it and pepper it, and then rub it into the salt and pepper on like your little board, and mm -hmm. then eat it. And it takes this stupid little piece of cauliflower, and it's only the fact that you flattened it so that the salt and pepper would really just stick to it well instead of just falling off. And if you tried to salt a piece of cauliflower regularly, the salt would just fall off. And you eat this thing and you think to yourself, this is the most delicious thing. And it's only because you learned it. Now, I'm not going to say that it would be delicious to you. The whole point of a system is that you're learning how you personally can enjoy the food that is also coincidentally the best for you. And you can tell the difference. I'll give you another example. Let's say you went into the salad bar and you were trying to stay, you were trying to watch your weight. And it's a bad salad bar because of the, uh, the crisis. And it only has two items. There's plain pasta and a plain white potato. Which one do you choose if you're trying to watch your weight? Go. Which, which uh, one would you choose? Plain pasta or what's that, what was the other one? Or, or just a plain white potato. Uh, white potato, maybe? I think so. All right. So the answer is pasta. Hmm. And although bo both of them are uh, simple carbs, you would expect that both of them would be kind of bad for you in the sense that all simple carbs are going to you know, boost your glycemic index, etc. But for reasons that we don't exactly know, pasta doesn't boost you as much uh, your, your sugar, your glycemic index as much as a potato does. So they're actually not even close. So that was just one little piece of knowledge that I gave you. And suppose there would be situations where you said, well, I don't really have a preference taste-wise. I like potatoes. I like pasta. Now you have the choice. Mm. So having simply a system where you learn how to compare foods and which ones are better than others and then also how to prepare them allows you to effortlessly have the right foods, effortlessly choose things which will maintain your weight, and you won't even be aware of it. Because what you want to do is get rid of your uh, any sense of willpower or like working to control your weight. You just turn it into knowledge instead of willpower. Willpower doesn't work. There's a reason that people fail at diets. If you're using your willpower, you're eventually it's going to exhaust. And you're just going to say, ah, i got to have the french fries and the cake. But if you build it into a system where every day the only thing you're doing is eating, you're just eating. Mm. So I'll go downstairs and the only things I have to eat in the house – are all the things which I've experimented with that couldn't make me fat no matter how much I ate of them. Like I could, I could eat everything in my kitchen all day long and like I get a little distended, 
but then I'd, you know, use the restroom and I'd, I'd be back to my normal way. Because, you know, if you eat right, you almost can't get fat. Now, this also assumes that you have an exercise system. So for the exercise system, uh, I tell people that the, the goal, well, I won't use the word goal, but what you want to do is uh, have a lifetime system as opposed to I'm going to go to the gym at 2 o'clock today. So that would be more of a goal. I'm going to go to the gym. So here's, here's just some of the things you would learn. One of the things is uh, I would always reward myself immediately after exercising. So I'd go to the snack bar at my gym and I'd get a you know, delicious smoothie and I'd sit down and have some downtime just playing with Twitter and my phone, which I really, really enjoy if I've already worked out. Now, because it was such a good little treat that I would give myself, it, it, people are not that unlike dogs. If you give a dog a treat to do a trick, eventually it's just going to do that trick automatically and it's not even going to be thinking about it. You don't even need the treat after a while. So you want to train yourself that your exercise routine is not even part of the willpower stack anymore. It's just something you do because you get a reward. You do it because you want to. And then I also tell people to experiment continuously on how to exercise best. Because if you went to the gym and you did something you didn't like, you're not going to do that very often. So the whole trick is to do things that are easy enough that you're willing to go back tomorrow. So if, if, if you're not active every day, it doesn't have to be the gym, but you should you know, at least take a walk or you know, clean the garage or something. Just be active every day. Uh, and over time, you will just boredom alone will cause you to learn new tricks. You'll be talking to somebody and will say, hey, I... I'm playing squash. You ever play squash? And you'll be like, no, I never thought about it. How's squash? And then you try squash. Maybe that works for you. Maybe it doesn't. But you would A-B test every day, all the time, until you found a set of things which will make you exercise every day and look forward to it. Mm -hmm. If you can't get to look forward to it, you, then you do not have a system. You have a goal. The goal, I got to exercise even though it hurts. Good luck with that. Here, here's my system. I love exercising. Like today, I'm, I'm going to go for a nice walk because it's what I do during the, you know, the pandemic is keep my keep my immune system healthy. So I immediately modified my exercise so I never work myself to exhaustion because that would make me a little immune compromised for a little while. I don't want any of that. So I'm going to take this nice walk outdoors, and I'm not going to walk so hard that it hurts. It's just going to be a nice, slightly challenging work up a little bit of a sweat. Listen to my phone while I'm walking. My favorite show, I wait till my favorite show is on and I have that recorded and I'm listening to my phone and I'm, I'm just having a great time. Yeah. So, so am I going to get my exercise this week? Absolutely. And it's not because I have willpower. It's because I finally, after years, I've got a system that I know makes me happy. So I'm, I'm glad to go exercise and I'm glad to go eat. So I've, I've transformed willpower into just something I do every day that I like. Scott, is this so your way of telling us that you're going to be a health coach in your next chapter in your life? <laughs> you know, uh, I don't tell everybody this, but a big part of that book, even though it's only, a, I don't know, a chapter or two yeah. on the eating and diet, it's mostly about other things, about your life in general. But it was sort of a Trojan horse because I wanted to tell this message about how to have a system for those things. But I knew that because I'm not a doctor, you know, I have no credentials in any field that's relevant, sure. that that was a hard sell. So I literally buried the most important part uh, way back in the chapters in the book. And the, and the early chapters are also, they're designed to be super helpful, you know, the talent stack idea, et cetera. But um, I literally am pacing the reader to get them to uh, believe my story enough by the time they get to those chapters that it overcomes the fact that I don't have any professional credentials. And I try to only write about things that you can obviously check on your own. Yeah. Like I'm not going to make a scientific claim unless I show a source. But if I say to you, for example, um, and this is one of my tricks, so, excuse me, I've got allergies today. Uh, one of my techniques I write about, I learned this from um, my hypnosis coach. Uh, I, I learned hypnosis years ago. Right. Yeah. And, he taught me that if you don't want to go to the gym and work out, um, put on your workout clothes and give yourself permission to not go to the gym. So you, if you say, I got to go to the gym and you don't feel like it, 
you just can't do it because you, you just don't feel like that big of an investment. You're just tired. But you might be able to put on your sneakers. You might be able to put on your shorts because, you know, it's warm anyway. So I'll put on my shorts. And you just walk around a little bit. And what the hypnotist knows, uh, and I'm teaching you now, is that your body is a, is a two-way street. You know, you, you have thoughts and they cause you to dress a certain way. But dressing a certain way will actually uh, influence your thoughts. So if you can get yourself to put on the workout clothes, the clothes themselves become the tool that rewires your brain. And you just walk around and you've got your, your workout shoes on and you think to yourself, you know, I could at least take a walk. Or I could at least go to the gym. And then I can at least you know, keep my habit going. It's good to have a habit. One of the things I do... Uh, as part of my habit when I can go to the gym, you know, obviously I can now, but when I can, um, there'll be days when I really, really don't feel like exercising, but I can go to the gym and I'm depending on the gym to give me the energy when I get there. So I put myself together. I drive to the gym, I park, I walk across this long parking lot. I walk into the lobby of the gym. There's a big rock wall they have in the middle of the gym and I'll stand in front of the rock wall and I'll look around and I'll say, nope. And I'll literally I'll just turn around and I'll walk right out the door, get my car and drive home. Now about mm -hmm. three to four times a year, I'll do that. They never, it's never planned. It's just, well, it's not here, but I call that a success every time. And it is because I don't have a goal of going to the gym. If I did, it would be a failure. Right. What I have is a system that causes me to do things that even willpower couldn't get me to do. So if my system got me all the way to the lobby of the club, you know, my gym, I don't care that it didn't work that time because it's not about that. It's about all year Long and all year is looking good. <clears throat> and if I, if I went through that much trouble, even when I didn't want to work out, I got a strong system. So all the days that I don't have a problem with working out, I'm going to get to the gym. And, and indeed I do. So I always take that as a positive. It's like, wow, hmm. I really didn't want to work out today, but I got all the way to the gym. That's a good system. Yeah, that's really useful. I just caught up with a friend of mine a couple of days ago who was t telling me that he, because of this Corona thing and the fact that he loves going into the office normally and having conversations with real people and dressing up, he literally does the exact same thing that he would if he was to go into the office. He, he works at a bank, so he, he puts his suit on, he shaves, he does his hair, puts on deodorant, like does the exact thing from the beginning to all the way to the end and then takes off the clothing even though he's just walking across the room to go into his, you know, into his office. And I was like, at first I was like, I thought that was crazy. But hearing the things that you're talking about that it's actually... Uh, you're, you're kind of like tricking your own mind to think that you're at a certain place or a certain mindset. And it's, to me, yeah, it's pretty smart. Uh, I mean, I'm still wearing sweatpants right now underneath, but. <laughs> that, that, yeah, you, your example is kind of perfect. Uh, here's another one. I can't work at home with shoes on. I don't know if you've if found that correlation. Mm, interesting. It, interesting. It, I need shoes, so I have to take on. my shoes off. <laughs> uh, bad example. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, for, for some reason I have such a strong association with if my shoes are on, I've got to be walking somewhere. Okay. I got I got to be doing something that I can't wear shoes if I'm going to be doing any kind of creative work. Now, the other thing I can't do is I can't take my feet off the ground if I'm working. Cause as soon as my feet go up to relax or I cross my legs and put them on the couch or something, I'm in relaxation uh, mode mm. and then I can't concentrate. You, you should see, and I don't even cross my legs usually. You have to have them open and flat on the ground, and that's your, that's your working position. And then if you keep that as your working position, then even the days you don't feel like working, the position will, will trigger you. It's, it's another trick. Interesting. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. And is that, is that personal? Like I – because I, I, I'm, I'm so into this stuff. Like one of the things I use to drink more water – it, to trick myself is just to drink. I'm drinking a smoothie right now. I don't know if you guys can see, but I just use a bigger jug than one of these smaller things that most people use because you just, your, your mind, you just keep drinking water and you're like, wow, I didn't really drink that much, but compared to what you would <laughs> normally be drinking, it's a lot. Uh, going back to the cauliflower example, one of the things I've done because, you know, I've grown up eating rice, there's this new trend now where people take cauliflower and they transform it into. They kind of replace it with rice, brown rice or white rice, 
and they use that in like poke bowls or they use that in you know other other things basically that makes it feel like it's rice for a lot right. of Asians that's that's like a huge thing because we just we can't live without rice you know um, yeah. yeah there's there's a lot of different examples I can't live without rice either I think I, I might be Asian because I can't, I can't go a day with I can't <laughs> in, go a day in a different rice. life yeah yeah it's my my favorite thing yeah um, yeah there there's also a similarity with uh, sleep systems. So one of the, uh, if you've ever read on the, the science of what's the best technique for getting to sleep, which is a real big deal right now because people have a lot of stress, um, one of the biggest, probably the number one tip, there might be some others that are important, is that you shouldn't use your bed for anything but sleeping and you know, intimate behavior because Sex. Then, your bed becomes, <laughs> then your bed becomes associated with those things. Yeah, and uh, and maybe maybe those things shouldn't happen in the bed either. I think, but some <laughs> things just have to. Uh, and uh, but if you go to bed and that's where you start reading, or bed is where you watch TV and you're watching exciting things on TV, then you start thinking, oh, bed is where I got to wake up and my mind gets active. Uh, oh, so that's so number that, one yeah. tip: is don't use your don't use your bed for anything but sleeping and and the fun stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I use I use the same general principle all the time, mm. because brain brains are basically, we like to think our brains are rational, sort of like little computers that use the facts and they put the facts in order. So we don't really do that. But mostly brains are just pattern recognition machines, and we're not even good at knowing if these are real patterns. But we see a pattern, and we go, oh, it's a pattern, uh, and then association machines. Mm. So. You know, it's it's not a coincidence that beer commercials used to show attractive women because guys drink beer. They like attractive women. If they see attractive women around the beer, the, the association crosses over. It's the reason that, you know, Michael Jordan can sell a lot of sneakers and, and, and you and I can't. It's just the association. But, it, you know, if, if you think it's limited to commercials, you're missing one of the greatest techniques of managing your own life. Yeah. which is just ma manage your associations, manage your contrast. You know, when, you're, when your real estate broker takes you to, sh to show you the, the terrible house first, and you're like, oh, no, I'll never find a place. This house is terrible. I can never live here. And they show you a few more terrible houses, and you think, I'll never f buy a home. And then they show you the good one last. Mm. And, and you say, oh, that's 20% more than I was going to pay. But now that I've seen all these bad ones, that doesn't look like such a bad price anymore. Right. So I'm going to stretch. So if you manage contrast, um, associations, and you know, be aware of the patterns, then you understand how brains work, and then you can you can live your life in a way that's compatible with the way brains work, uh, instead of the crazy one where you imagine people are, are rational because yeah. we're not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I when I look at the internet, I mean. People can take this in a, in a bad way for sure, but the people that are using these types of brand associations and get you in the, into their funnel, I guess, or get you into their, get, kind of get your attention, right? And then they try to deliver something that's actually useful. Uh, I'm not going to name any names, but there's a lot of internet marketers that are out there that would use beautiful Instagram girls or Lamborghinis and whatnot or big houses and it gets most people's attention, right? And a lot of 15 to 18 year old uh, kids that want to make a lot of money or whatnot. It's just something that people are naturally going to 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 get their attention on. Um, but they get a lot of flack for it because of the fact that they're trying to sell this like get rich quick scheme. And I agree that there, it, it, it's, it, it's kind of gross, right? But there, there's a part of me, there's like the, 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 the branding or the, psych, like the, the love of psychology in me that I'm like, it's kind of smart because you, you are using something that in the end, instead of selling them like shit or drugs, you're tricking people and getting them to become more educated or to teach them something new. Yeah, the, the advertisers who are good at it will tell you that they're not trying to make you think differently. They're trying to make you feel different. So they're trying to make you feel something because that's what will activate, activate your buying and your brand loyal, loyalty. So they go directly for the feels, and they should. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and just the last point about picking projects, you, you do mention this good thing. I, um, there are 
some ways and some frameworks of picking projects that kind of that, that caps the downside. Um, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, so, um, so one of the things I like to tell people is that, uh, you know, you should test a lot of things in my life. I actually, uh, took account of how many things I tried in terms of businessy sort of efforts and how many things succeeded. And when I counted them up and there, there are more of them now, cause this was a few years ago, there was something like over 30 different business things I had tried. Now, some of them were uh, projects within Dilbert, you know, like a licensing thing or something. So they weren't all new businesses. There were efforts within businesses. And so there were about 30 of them. And my successes were about three. Wow. And, 10%. and you know, I'm, I'm operating at a pretty high level. So people, I think if you were an observer, you would say, hey, this guy succeeded at these things. I'll bet he could do this. I'll bet he could reproduce this. And the answer is some people can. I never know if that's luck. If you have, you know, some entrepreneur has, you know, two big startups or three. I never know how much of that is skill because somebody's going to have two or three good ones in a row, right? You're guaranteed that by the law of large numbers and lots of people doing different things. And in my own life, I say, you know, I do think I have, you know, genuine skills that have commercial value, but even I can't just start a business tomorrow and it works. I'm about one in 10. So I tell people that that's probably not unusual, that one in 10 things works out well. And so you should have a strategy that allows that to happen. So you should be trying lots of stuff and you should try things that don't kill you if they don't work. So you're not bankrupt if it doesn't work. You're not you know, embarrassed to the point where you can never show your face in public again. You're not dead. So as long as you're, you're capping your, your cost, you can kind of experiment with stuff and, and, and leave them when they don't work. Now, here's the other tip, and this is important. Things you, tr you need to identify what's going to work before you've gone too far because you don't want to like put everything into something and it just doesn't work. And there's a rule that I've discovered over the years that is really solid for telling when something is going to work and when it won't. And it goes like this. Things that are going to work really well work even when they're poorly designed. So I'll give you an example. The first cell phones, you know, back when I was young and before you were born, these big bricks that you couldn't call anybody and it dropped every call and it was almost worthless in terms of actual utility. But people wanted them. They wanted them a lot. And so sure enough, that was you could predict that they would just get better and better until you have your smartphone. Take the first fax machines. Again, you know, you're you're too young to know the horror of the early fax machines that they would bunch up the paper, you know, they would lose paper. They were the early ones. I think were thermal paper. I mean, they were just awful. And if and if it was your job to go send a fax, your heart would sink. You're like, oh, this is going to be all afternoon. <laughs> By the time I find the paper, it's a special paper. That you got to call to make sure they got it, and it's just. It's a horrible product, yeah. and they couldn't sell them fast enough. I mean, you couldn't sell fax machines fast enough during that age. And you can go right down the line. The, the very first personal computers were really quite terrible, mm. but we couldn't get, get enough of them. So I always look for that. What, what will people buy in its terrible form that predicts that they like the good version? There, there has to be something... This speaks to them. And, and I have a theory that the things which really have that X factor quality um, are triggering something in us related to mating. Mating, okay. That, yeah, our mating instinct. Let me give you some examples. Facebook is mostly about finding faces. And faces were, are very tied to our sense of finding somebody to reproduce with. Because the, the face is the first thing you say. You're looking for symmetry. You're looking for, you know, just faces are, we're tuned to that. So if you look at any product that shows you a lot of faces, it's more often going to succeed. Um, mm -hmm. So that's rule number one. Uh, and then you take, say, Instagram. Instagram is a place where you can just peacock and you can show your best qualities as, as you artificially are presenting them. Because what do people want to do when they want to reproduce? Show off. 
So you want to say, oh, look, I've got this skill. I can do this thing. I have this look. Um, I have this money so that people want to mate with you. Now, the people on Instagram are not thinking, oh, I'm going to make somebody want to mate with me. You know, they're, ha they're having more ordinary thoughts. But everything stems from our just basic reproduction um, thing. So, you know, you could take that and you could look at a whole lot of successful products and you just keep finding that that mechanism over and over. And I, arguably, even with a product that simply allows you to communicate is also a mating thing. Because right. the, the more people you can communicate with, the greater your options are for finding somebody who's a good mate. So anything that doesn't have that quality, that it could help you with mating directly or indirectly, is a tough sell. And the ones that just seem to be magically popular from day one are either are, are either giving you power, which you also like for reproductive purposes, like uh, your smartphone – in addition to be able to, to, to um, connect with people, it gives you a sense of power. Right. So I think anything that's a tool that makes you richer or more effective or potentially smarter, every one of those things has a hook in it that you could say, yeah, I would rather mate with somebody who's smarter, successful, and I know who they are. I can find them. So when you start seeing it that way, you know, when, yeah. when your filter gets set to look at every product as a reproduction artifact yeah it it explains the world pretty well yeah i i agree with you i i think that's at least how i personally i can't speak for anything else but i've always also thought that a lot of these things that you mentioned can come from survival instincts in that back in the day the reason potentially the reason why we like the visual things versus non-visual things is that we had to look for things that were surrounding us in order to survive. Similar to communication from phone to social networks to fax machines, communication can be mating, but it can also be a form of survival because you have to warn others. You have to warn your own tribe that other people are going to come attack you or whatnot. And I, th I think branding, a lot of it has to do with it. Like they said that we're naturally attracted to the color red because back in the day, uh, red represented, bright red especially, represented two main things, which is blood and ripe fruit. And it's part of the reason why a lot of brands originally use a lot of, I don't know if they thought about that, but at least that's why we are attracted to red apparently. But I don't know if that's all a theory. I don't know. I'm sure you know a lot more about this, Scott. <laughs> well, I, would, I, um, I never know if we know exactly the reason for things. We, we put reasons on things that are just observations. If, if you ask me, you know, had I been the scientist who discovered that red was important to people, I probably would have said because it's rare. And everything that um, is an exception to your environment automatically gets your attention because your brain can't process everything that's happening. So it, 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 uh, it moves to sort of uh, I don't know, part of the brain that just takes things for granted if everything's always the same because you don't yeah. want to be thinking about everything. You just put it on autopilot and then something different pops up and your brain is tuned to find the thing that's different or wrong. So if you go walking in the woods, how much red do you see? Mm. Almost none. Right. right. Um, so unless it's like a berry or something. So, you know, it could get to your blood or food uh, reason, but I, I think it would be enough that it's just different. That would also catch your attention. Sure. Sure. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I think so. I think, I think we were just rifting on the idea of picking projects. Uh, we had James Altucher on, uh, about a month or two ago. I don't know if you ever had, if you were ever on his podcast or if you yeah, know I've James. On, yeah. A few times I've been on his podcast. Uh, and he was talking to me about, cause we were talking about a similar topic and I think we mentioned your book and he was, he was picking frameworks that would help us pick better skills. And he mentioned something interesting, which is there are certain skills that lead to more optionality versus others. When one example that he gave was stand-up comedy. And I asked him specifically, did uh, public speaking help you become a better stand-up comedian? And he said, no, not really. But he said that stand-up comedy made him a better public speaker. And I found that fascinating because like, why, why wouldn't the work why wouldn't it work in both ways? So there are certain skills that you can invest or certain projects that you do that can help you achieve more in the long run. 
because of that yeah. skill. Yeah, uh, let, let me say a little bit about that. So I used to do a lot of public speaking, which was mostly stand-up comedy. I would just do the corporate version where I'd show my comics and make people laugh. And I, I would echo what uh, James said, which is um, when you're doing comedy, you're putting yourself at the greatest risk of embarrassment. Like mm -hmm. that's that's as much embarrassment as you could put yourself in. But if you're doing regular public speaking – the thing that people worry about the most is getting embarrassed, but there isn't really that much risk. Mm. So if you do the thing that has a gigantic risk, which is comedy in front of a live audience, by the time you go to do an ordinary thing, which is oh, I'm just going to talk to 20 people in this room and you know tell them about a thing, that is easy. <laughs> so it's sort yeah. of like the base baseball player who puts the, the donut on the bat. So it's heavier when they do their practice swings and it's light when they play. Yeah, doing doing live comedy – and the risk involved of that will make you immune to almost any embarrassment. Hmm. Fascinating, fascinating. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they, we, we're talking about this book a lot because it, it certainly was one of my favorite books, but you also have another book that perhaps made you more into the limelight, which is Win Bigley, and that talks about the one and only Donald Trump, and you correctly predicted that he would win the election in 2016. Um, we'll certainly get into that, but I do want to get into more about, at least this is generally what most people want to hear, which is like what's happening with Corona and everything. Uh, how do you think he as a, a president is handling all of this? Well, I always say that there's no such thing as a good president and a bad president, because by the time you make it all the way to get elected to president, you definitely have skills, right? We, we've never had an untalented president. That just, just doesn't happen in our system. But you could have personalities and skill sets that are either matched for the situation or not. Uh, I've said, for example, that Obama was well-matched to the 2009 you know, economic um, situation because he has such a steady personality, and, and you would trust that he looked into the facts. You know he was going to talk to the experts. You knew that whatever was going to come out of it was a, a well-balanced, considered plan. And that's what the country needed. They wanted somebody to just say, okay, make us feel like you know what's going on. We don't know what's going on, but make us feel like you know. And make us feel like you got control of this. Make us feel like you've looked at all the facts. And then we can feel comfortable and then our comfort becomes the psychology of the economy, and then, then we can recover. So I use that as an example of a president whose personality was really well fit for that situation. Now, fast forward to um, current day. Prior to the coronavirus, I always said Trump was the perfect personality for the time. We need somebody to be tough with China in a way that only he was willing to do. We needed, probably needed somebody to be a little more strict on the borders. We didn't know how important that would be until the coronavirus came. We needed somebody who could be a cheerleader for the economy, which was doing well by then. Yeah. So now you need a different personality. You need a salesman. You need the, the guy who's going to boost it that extra 20%. Trump is perfect for that job. And then the coronavirus hit. And the, and the president we needed was the one who, who feels us. Hmm. You know, we, we wanted to know that the pain and the feel, fear that we were feeling was shared by our leader so that you'd feel comfortable that he would act as though he were you. In other words, okay, I can't solve my own problem in this case. It's too big. It's the country. But I need to know that you, my leader, feel it the mm. way I feel it because then you're going to act as seriously as I would act and you're going to act in my interest because you feel the same thing. And Trump doesn't do that well. He, he's not the empathy guy. I mean, he throws down some words and they're sort of in the right order, but he doesn't seem like he's got that sincere empathy. It feels like he's saying the words. Um, so he's not well suited for the empathy part. But uh, what's coming up, he's really well suited for, <laughs> better suited than maybe anybody has ever been suited, which is he's going to make the hardest question or he's going he's to make the hardest decision that maybe any president has ever made. You know, you could argue going to war in World War II or the Iraq War were big. I'm not sure they're big like this. I think this is bigger than all of them. Because, mm. you know, we were definitely going to go to war sooner or later in World War II, etc. But he's going to make a, a choice that could 
you know, save the economy or destroy civilization. I mean, if you got it really wrong, you could you could do that. And I think he's actually the perfect personality for this because number one, he's not afraid of it. You know, if I, if I said to you, all right, here's the deal. You personally are going to have to make the decision that could cost us trillions of dollars and might kill a million people. Go. And you'd say, ah, no, no, maybe somebody else can help make me this decision. I don't want to be the guy. But Trump, I think, feels that he's in the right place at the right time. He's got the right skills, and I agree. He listens to his experts enough to make me happy anyway, at least in this case. And he might be the perfect one because ultimately he's going to have to make a decision that could kill thousands or hundreds of thousands of Americans, the people on his team. He's going to have to, you know, he won't know the names of the people. It's statistical deaths. But man, is that a hard decision. And I feel like there's nobody I would rather have make that decision right now. Because well, why do you think he has the skill set or the mentality to to make a, at least a sound decision? Is it because he's he's confident he, or emotion, like emotionally it, confident about that? I think he has demonstrated the ability to do what he sure is right, even if it's not popular. Uh, in other words, he won't be just influenced by what the public wants him to do. And we've seen enough examples of that, you know, the trade war with China, that wasn't a very popular thing, mm -hmm. but now we see, now we see it, it was probably a good thing. Um, so I know that he can do unpopular things. That's the first reason I trust him. The second is he has a history of, um, being the, uh, the referee for experts. So, you know, he's run this big empire for, you know, the Trump industries and it's not like Trump is an architect. It's not like he's an engineer or the, the contractor, but he had to take all of these experts who would come in, presumably, I assume this is what his life looked like before. And the, the, the architect would say, I can't build this thing this way. And the engineer says, yes, you can, or vice versa. And he's the boss. Right. And he doesn't know those skills, but he's got to figure out which one is reliable. You know, look in the eyes. Is this one full of it? Is this one got an agenda? So he has, he has demonstrated the skill to listen to experts who don't have, who have knowledge that he doesn't have and figure out which ones are telling the truth and make a complicated billion dollar decision based on it. He's done that all his life. He just so, seems a little, um, in, I mean, most people would, would, agree with emotionally reactive and I mean an example an analogy is like investing in stocks so Warren Buffett is probably one of the best decision makers in terms of in that world at least and he's the least emotional so wouldn't that kind of contradict the fact that so you know he may be okay with the decision but it may not be the right decision because of how emotional reactive he is well I wouldn't use the word emotional I think that takes you to the wrong place I would say that he always fights back so any criticism, he will attack. But we, we've watched it for years, and it hasn't broken anything. In other words, we're just used to it, right? I mean, if, if tomorrow the Pope insulted President Trump, and Trump came out and said, you know, I think the Pope should quit, he should be fired, he should delete his account, uh, it would be a big national story, and, and a week later it wouldn't matter at all. We would just know it was stuff people talked about in public, and that's it. it didn't didn't affect you, didn't affect me. So I think people look at him, let's say, battling with the reporters, and while you could, I can see why you could say that's emotional, but it has such a functional purpose, mm -hmm. which is he he has he has discredited the press to the point where where it gives him an advantage, and I think we came out ahead because I don't know if the whole country understood that the news was largely made up, you know, except for the fa except for the facts we can all check. All the opinion stuff, the, the framing on it is really illegitimate, far more than it ever had been in history. Yeah. And I think, I think that if he fights with those people, I say, well, you're supposed to be fighting with that. Like, why wouldn't you fight with that? Um, but if all he's doing is fighting, I don't call that emotional. Yeah. Because, yeah. Because fighting is why we hired him. That's, that's, that's the feature, not the flaw. So do you think it's less about him being able to make the right decision, but it's more about how he'll be able to bounce back from it, whatever decision he makes because of his ability to sell and because of his ability to persuade and really just not give a fuck <laughs> that, that what other people think? 
Well, I think this will be a decision where we're going to have to just try something. We're yeah. going to have to understand that there's a really high chance that whoever the leader is and whatever the decision is, it could be wrong. And, and it could be not only wrong, but it could be like really wrong. Mm. And it could it could even be what the experts advised and still be really wrong because we're yeah. in that kind of a foggy world. So I think what we have to depend on is that we can measure things uh, well enough that we can quickly pull back and adjust. And, you know, I think we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll figure our way to the other side, but it's not going to be whatever this is the first guess is. You know, I think we'll have to tweak it a little. Yeah, I imagine there's really no one that's going, no president, whoever it might be, it would win whatever decision they make because whatever decision they make is probably going to be wrong in some way. It's going to be right in some way. There's just no, <laughs> there's no answer, right? I, I was uh, I was noting uh, this morning on my Periscope that uh, what is obviously missing from the news is Democrats and let's say all the critics of the president, the standard critics, they're not giving their plan. And the reason is that the president has not revealed what his plan is yet. And they mm -hmm. don't want to accidentally go in public and say, this is what I would do. Because what if the president says, yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Then all the critics have thrown away their only ammunition, which is, okay, I just said in public I would want to do the same thing. So you can't really criticize him. So all of his critics are really, really quiet. And I can't think of any other time that they would be silent because usually you know the president's opinion so you just say, well, mine is the opposite. It's all a mistake. Yeah. But they don't know. So they don't know what to disagree with. And it's really revealing that their opinions are not actually um, organic opinions where they just sat down and said, you know, all things being equal, what would I do? Okay, that's what I'll recommend. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really clear that that process is not what the critics of the president go through. But rather they wait for him to talk and they say, nope, that's wrong. Whatever that was, that's wrong. It's just sort of a reflex at this point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, despite all this stuff, though, he still has almost like a 50% approval rating. And it's hard to explain. I, 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 my theory is that they, human beings, as, as we kind of go back to like the tribal ages, we are tribal by nature. And back before all of this, it was it, there was like, Democrats versus Republicans, and it still is in some ways. The country was certainly divided because the enemy, there wasn't like a really clear enemy in many ways. Whereas now, this enemy is this fucking invisible virus that we can't identify. And when we, most human beings, like when we have a common enemy, we tend to come together. And whatever Trump may not be empathetic or whatnot, I think people live, people, a lot of people are in this fear mode. So I think psychologically, they, they must kind of at least open their arms to whoever is going to feel like they're going to help uh, on this side. And I guess instead of like Team Trump or Team Clinton, it became more of like a Team America or Team World because there is this common enemy that we all have to fight. We have to come together in some ways. Yeah, I don't think in my lifetime we have ever come together this, this much. Now, if you were to watch TV, you'd still see the critics because they have a business model that requires them to be critics. But, um, you know, if there's somebody in my neighborhood who, who can't eat this week, I'm not going to ask them their political party. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to help them with some groceries. And, uh, you know, I don't even know what party Fauci's in. I mean, is he a Democrat? I don't know. Do I care? Not a bit. Not even a little bit. Uh, you see the governors, the Democratic governors saying, you know, in, you know, in this moment, I got to tell you, the president's doing everything we ask of him and the president being similarly complimentary to them. So I've never seen the country come together this much, but surely we'll go back to our, you know, our tribal corners later. Now, I, I have to comment. You said it's, it's sort of puzzling. And I can see how this would be for people to say, how in the world is he even close to 50% popular? And mm. of course, it's almost entirely Republicans. But from the Republican point of view, this is a key difference. The way the Democrats and the critics look at him, they say, he says all these things that aren't true, so he's a big old liar. And that's, that's sort of their frame, big old liar. You can't have a big old liar as your president. Or, or worse, it's not even lying, he just doesn't even know the facts. Like if it's science or something, they'll say, oh, he, he doesn't know. That's their frame. Here's the frame from the Republicans. Everything he promised, he's doing. 
<laughs> there is, or at least he's trying. So even the people who say, uh, you, you promised us more wall, there's nobody who would doubt that he's been fighting like a wounded weasel to get his wall. He's pushed every door open. He's kicked yet kicked every dog. You know, I shouldn't use that analogy. But uh, he's, he, he's pushed every button. He's pulled every lever. Now, he still doesn't have much of a wall, right? Yeah. He's got a little over 100 miles or something. But even the Republicans are saying, okay, it's, it's pretty clear he's trying to get us that wall. So if you were to look at promises, you know, that he uses the promises made, promises kept, uh, you know, you can start at the top. You know, I will pick my judges from this list. I'll cut your taxes. I'll negotiate with China. I mean, you could just go right down the list. And if you're a Republican, you say, and this is the weird part, you would say he's the most honest politician we've ever seen. Hmm. Because people who are at least a little savvy, they watch you know, the things he says that don't pass the fact checking. And we say, well, that's sort of directionally true. You know, do I care if he inflated the number of people at his rally? No. Do I care if he said this is the, the best whatever in 100 years, but it's only been 50 years? No. I don't care about any of that stuff. But here's this list of promises. That's why we voted for him. And damn, he's working on that list. I mean, he's really putting political capital. He's just pulling down all the stops. So if you're a Republican, you don't care about the fact checking because none of it's important. You know that he's pushing for the things you want and he's pushing hard and you like it. Yeah. I mean, I, I, there, there was, I think people are still puzzled by this, but um, it's, it's easy to kind of divide Republicans into one category or one perception and Democrats into one perception. But when it came to the voting in 2016, I think a lot of people that, especially in the kind of the, the, the middle parts of America, um, you know, when, when you're talking about the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, a lot of people financially were, were struggling. And here comes a uh, proposed billionaire and promises all these things. And there is this perception uh, and persuasion skills that he has that can get people to think that this guy is going to help us struggle, uh, come out of this struggle. And when it comes to the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, like food and housing and like taking care of your kids and family, that comes first. And I think a lot of people brushed off whatever you know, BS that he said about inflating rallies and, uh, you know, a lot of the controversies that he may have been because the, their primary focus and, and priority is taking care of their their own, their family. And that's what matters to them. At least he gave them the perception uh, because of the persuasion skills that you talk about in, in with Bigley. Um, and yeah, I'd love to dig into a little bit more, more about that. I think, you know, I know you talked about this a lot on the podcast and different ones that you've had, but um what are some of the things that you could point out that makes Donald, Donald Trump uh, persuasive as he is? Well, it's interesting to, to talk about it from today's perspective, because when I was first talking about it, um, my credibility was very low. And I would say things like, you know, that simple uh, language and vocabulary he uses that you're all mocking. That's exactly the right thing to do for persuasion. Because the public wants simple, easy to understand things. They want them repeated forever so it sinks in. That's just perfect persuasion. And when I was first saying that, you'd see all these stories about how he had a, uh, the vocabulary of a fourth grader. And there must be something wrong with his brain because he keeps speaking in simple ways. And he didn't always do this when he was young. But you don't hear that anymore. And it's because finally even the Democratic experts weighed in the the linguistic experts the professors and said yeah you know i hate to tell you but this is super effective they said <laughs> so, that oh yeah yeah uh george lakoff uh who's a linguistic expert from berkeley he's one of the ones who says it so he's basically agreeing with i don't know close to everything i've said mm -hmm. about trump's persuasion but he's taking it from you know the opposition side as more of a warning it's like warning warning this is all real technique. This is not working by accident. It's working because it's the right stuff. And, and the other side is not doing the right stuff. It's not an accident. It's technique. And, and uh, you don't hear people complaining about Trump having a fourth grade vocabulary now, do you? I mean, when was the last time somebody complained about that? It used to be like a big thing. 
But I think we've learned that it's technique. Here's the other thing. Um, Trump talks in visual language. And that's super persuasive because we're visual people. Our, our visual sense just overwhelms our other senses. So if you can speak to the visual, you have an advantage. As opposed to, let's say, Hillary Clinton speaking to a concept where Trump would say, we need a wall. Now, what he should have said if he had been like other people, well, we need better border security. It could be any combination of things. We'll have the experts look into it. Maybe we need some structures in some places, but other times it could be physical assets. And what would you say to that? You'd say, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, none, of that, none of that is catching with my, my excitement. And it doesn't even sound real. It sounds like just a politician going blah, 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 blah. But if you stand in front of the public and you say, I'm going to build you a physical wall across the entire border and I'm going to make Mexico pay for it, how do you turn away? You know, the, the making the Mexico pay for it is the secret sauce that he adds to everything, which is, all right, here's my, here's my ordinary idea. You might like it, you might hate it, but it's an ordinary idea. And now I'm going to add this little provocative thought and Mexico is going to pay for it. And everybody says, that's impossible. There's no way you're going to make Mexico pay for your wall, and it makes you think past the wall. So in other words, he's making you talk about who's paying for it, and it uncritically, this is another persuasion technique, it uncritically makes you accept that there's something like a wall, and the question is who pays for it. So you watch how many times he makes you think past the sale, that's what it's called, um, and he does it reflexively, he does it automatically, he does it all the time. And you don't watch other politicians doing it. Now ask George Lakoff or anybody who's an expert in this and say, which is the better technique? We're going to build a wall and make Mexico pay for it. Ridiculous, right? Or being logical and calm and rational and having a budget and saying we can do that. At this point, if you say, okay, George Lakoff, which one of these was more persuasive? It's no question. No question about it. It's hands down. Trump is more persuasive. Do you think, because you, you mentioned reflex, like, do you think he's has this master uh, plan to say certain things in a certain way? Or, or is he not even thinking about it? Like, does he not even know that he's doing it? Because <laughs> um, you met him, right? You met him after you wrote yeah. the book, Win Bickley. So what's he we, like it, privately, one-on-one, -on -one, or whoever, like in less public setting without a camera on, versus in a public setting, because that would tell a lot. Yeah, so the first thing you need to know, obviously people don't talk about the details of conversations with presidents, but I'll right. give you the, the basic flavor of it. Um, in person, he is uh, completely normal in every way that you'd want a person to be normal. So if, you, if you're watching him in public and say, hey, he's acting crazy, is he like that in person? The answer is no, no. I mean, he's very much like you see him in, in public. He, is, he doesn't have like some extra personality or something. But he's he's got super charisma and his social skills are just off the chart. Like you stand in the room with him and just everything disappears. But here's the, here's the amazing part. He's the president of the United States, commander in chief of the greatest military force of all time. And he invites me into the Oval Office. And, and I'm sitting there. And for the entire time I was there chatting with him, he gave me the impression that he didn't care about anything in the world except what I was saying. Now, think about that. So my experience of it was he was not distracted. He was, he was completely focused on me and what I was saying. He had, he had smart questions to, to get me to say interesting things. And it's just a whole different you know, vibe than what he does in, in public. Very, very warm, very personal um, social skills just off the charts. And by the way, I, I think, you know, his family has that too. I got to meet Ivanka, you know, probably runs in the family, just they have amazing social skills. Anyway, so there's that. Uh, the question you asked me about meeting him in person was, oh, if he does it reflexively or he's using technique. And I actually talked to him about that. I won't tell you exactly what he said or I said, but I'll give you, give you the flavor of it. Um, and I'll use me as an example. So I learned hypnosis. I've studied persuasion for years. Right. But when I'm talking, I'm not conscious, typically, I'm not conscious of using technique. 
It's just something you learn that becomes part of the way you convey things. So if I talk visually more than other people, it's not because I thought about it at the time. It's just something I've learned over the years, and it's just automatic after a point. It's sort of like when you first learn to type, you have to think where the letter is and then put your finger on it. But if you learn it enough, you're just looking at the screen and, and words are just appearing on the screen and you're not conscious of the process. So the quick answer is he, uh, I'm sure he's not conscious of the process. That part I, I can say confidently. But he does have a, a strange and wonderful history that his uh, pastor or minister, I never know the right word, of his church when he was a kid, his family would go to a church with uh, Norman Vincent Peale, yeah. who, who was not only his minister, by great coincidence, but also the most famous author of um, The Power of Positive Thinking. Now, The Power of Positive Thinking, I would say, is a branch of persuasion. It, you know, it's not the whole persuasion ball, but it's a, it's a big old part of it. And you see that technique in Trump all the time. So I think that he may not have been aware of learning it per se, but he had it modeled in front of him by the most famous effective practitioner of all time. In fact, Norman Vincent Peale was so effective that he was accused by his critics in the day of being a, a secret hypnotist. They were like, mm. are you a hypnotist? Because he was so good at it. So when you see Trump um, talking about how the economy will be great and even with the coronavirus and all this, you can see the, the echoes of Norman Vincent Peale you know, through the ages because he was so powerful. They, and by the way, uh, I should say that Norman Vincent Peale was one of my biggest influences too. And people always comment that I seem too optimistic for the situation. Mm -hmm. And it's probably not a coincidence. I mean, I think I might be naturally optimistic, but I learned it. And, and incorporated it, and I have consciously over my life said, okay, try to try to think of this as positive. What's what's the upside? Yeah. And so, so trained myself to do that somewhat automatically now. So I think that he's picked up a whole bunch of techniques. He's negotiated. He wrote the he wrote the book, The Art of the Deal. Uh, well, he uh, he had a ghostwriter, but you know he at least was very familiar with the topic, of course. Yeah. So I think that. Um, between the fact that negotiating is his brand and he's done a lot of it, and then you add that the Norman Vincent Peale stuff and his natural talent, I think you just end up being a good salesperson, you know, putting all those things together. Yeah. I mean, you as a hypnotist and being able to reverse engineer a lot of these persuasion techniques, I imagine you picked up infinite loads. Like it was for you, it was like, I'm sure you were so visual and observant about every single thing that he was doing when he was meeting yeah. you in a private place, right? Oh, uh, well, I wasn't, wasn't really thinking of, that, uh, of it in those terms. We were just having a conversation, so I was sort of concentrating on just what we were talking about. Um, but he's, he definitely has the whole package. So if you ask me, did he get to be president by luck, I would say no, even though there are lots of smart people who say, it was just luck. He just got there by luck. I'm like, no. That is a lot of skill, a lot of skill. Mm -hmm. Well, do you think, to bring you to the million dollar question, do you think there will be a re-election? Now we're down to two. We've got Joe Biden and <laughs> Trump. Uh, <laughs> probably both going to be the oldest presidents that we've ever had. What are, the, uh, what are the chances that you think? Well, I had predicted... Um, uh, let's say uh, two years ago was when mm -hmm. I first predicted that Kamala Harris <laughs> would be the nominee. Uh, mm -hmm. And I've always predicted that Trump will win re-election um, probably easily. Uh, but so then I thought I'm wrong. Oh, I'm wrong. It looks like she dropped out of the race and it looks like it's going to be Biden. But if Biden picks Kamala Harris as his vice president, uh, there is a general feeling, even among Democrats, if, if we're being honest, even the Democrats are saying, I don't know if Joe's young enough and capable enough. So I think people are going to look at the vice president as maybe the who would be the president three months after election or even maybe before Election Day. It, it wouldn't surprise me if you saw the Democrats decide to flip the ticket, you know, two weeks before election. I, I could imagine that happening. Or even not flipping it and just saying, okay, but just understand that Kamala is going to be the president if you vote for Joe. So um, if he picks her, I think she is the de facto president. 
So my prediction, at least, would be um, generally right, although not technically right. And I don't see any way he can lose to anybody who's being discussed. Now, you, you can make a case that if, Mar, you know, uh, if uh, Andrew Cuomo suddenly entered the race, he, he would have a good shot, actually, you know, especially after this stuff. Yeah. But I don't see it happening because um, Cuomo strikes me as too ethical to abandon his city in an emergency to campaign for president. It would be suicide, I think. But I, I, my sense of him is that he has an actual public um, – a, a public – interest that's beyond his personal political interest. I could be wrong. You know, I'm just I'm giving you my subjective judgment of his personality. And of course, I can't read his mind. But if I had to guess, I think he's too good of a person to run for president because it would put his state at a disadvantage. But do you, don't you think that it wouldn't be, I mean, sure, I'm sure it's personal, but it's it's still remaining loyal to what he is because he would just say that He's trying to be loyal for the country because Trump is doing this and this. So yeah. in, in that sense, New York is also going to benefit from that because he'll be in charge of the whole country. You yeah, you know, will, yeah. No, he, he could make the argument. But the fact is that you can't be a governor during an emergency and also campaigning for president. You know, the, nobody would imagine that you could have your energy, you know, that you could split your energy so grossly. I mean, you even look at the senators who run for president. They basically abandon their job. Mm -hmm. It's sort of the only way you can do it. And given that Trump has such a dominating, you know, public, uh, you know, podium that he's always in the news, they would have to campaign pretty hard. There's yeah. no way that he wouldn't be able to put serious effort into it. And uh, imagine, imagine if he said, "Okay, I'll run for president, but I'm not even going to campaign. I'll just, you know, do my New York State thing here. If you want to vote for me, go ahead." I don't know. Would people feel like he was serious? And, and suppose he lost, would people say, you know, you should have let somebody run who was going to campaign? So right. I don't I don't think he has like a clean, comfortable way to get there. And, you know, Biden's probably not going to go easily. You know, uh, I don't know who talks to him about these things, but I'm sure he doesn't want to go in some embarrassing way. So yeah. I don't see I don't see anybody replacing him at this point. But the vice presidential pick is the wild card. Yeah, the, I've, I've, I actually haven't heard that theory. It's, it, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, so you think that Joe Biden, if he wins, he will find, because he did announce that he'll find a female VP, you think that person within that same term, if he wins, will make that vice president the president? Uh, I think that uh, Joe's advisors in general, you know, his cabinet, his vice president, and anybody close to him, will have an unusually large influence on the presidency because Biden himself is sort of a, a weak personality. Um, so, and the vice president just being close will probably have maybe potentially depending on the personality. If yeah. it were Kamala Harris, she has a personal relationship with him. Um, not everybody knows, but she was very close with his son who is deceased. So she actually had a long-term family kind of connection with Biden. So one could easily see that they would have a close relationship. One could easily see that the Democratic leaders would channel their preferences through Kamala Harris because she's sort of tied into the, you know, the, the Democratic leadership. Um, so whether or not she actually took the job and became the leader in name, I don't know if that even matters because I think she would be the at least the channel for which the Democratic um, – leadership's opinions would be funneled into the presidency. Doesn't that kind of defeat this whole idea of having a voting system if the nation decided not to vote for a person like Kamala, but in the end she becomes, if she was to, if this was to happen, but she becomes a president anyways, wouldn't, wouldn't people actually be infuriated because she went through the exact same system, was not voted, lost by a heavy mile, compared to some of these big candidates, but she would still become president? That would infuriate people. Well, the people who were, let's say, the campaign managers for candidates who didn't get that far will be really, really mad. But the one thing you can depend on is that the Democrats will back the Democrats and the Republicans will back the Republicans. So no matter how a, a hypothetical Kamala Harris accidental presidency would be, all the Republicans would dislike her, but would have anyway. 
doesn't matter who the president is. All the Democrats will say, well, that's maybe not the way we wanted to do it, but she's pretty good. And, yeah. and, they'll, and they'll back her. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, Scott, um, let's do a famous prediction. I know this is something you're quite talented at, uh, and you've obviously made a very big prediction. In terms of everything that is happening, well, two predictions. Everything is happening with Corona. What is the next six to 12 months look like? And when do you think Trump will decide to keep everything, oh, get everything open again? Well, I've got the uh, the bad news and the good news version. So it's sort of two potential worlds. The good news version depends on us developing some kind of solution that has not yet been developed. Now, it could be just discovering it. So, for example, what if hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin and zinc turns out to really, really work well if you get it to people early? So what if that's true? We don't know that yet, but what if it is true? Well, that, that gives us a real path forward because then we could say, okay, unless you're the most at risk, go back to work. The first cough, we give you this. You'll be home for a few days, and it doesn't really even matter if a lot of people get it. If the, a lot of people get it are the low-risk types of people, they'll just burn through it, get some herd immunity. Nobody goes to the ICU because the pill works, if it works. Now, I have some real questions whether that hydroxychloroquine is really going to be the magic pill. Mm -hmm. But another thing might be the um, the blood serum stuff where they take the people who have recovered, they have the antibodies, take their blood, take take the antibodies out, and then they can give it to other people to protect them. We don't know yet if that will be a magic bullet, but it could be. There's another magic bullet, DNA. Uh, I believe without – you know, the, the benefit of scientific proof. I believe that if we dig into it, we'll find there's some genetic um, similarities with the people who have the worst time with the coronavirus. So it probably has something to do with your ACE2 receptors, the smart people are saying in your lungs. Um, so it could be that we just test everybody and, and you say, hey, just spit in this tube. And in a week, I can tell you if you're a dangerous one or not. And if you're not in the danger zone, Take your hydroxychloroquine and go to work. You know, worst case, you got a got a couple of weeks off of work if you get sick. So, you can, and and then of course, if we could do mass testing, you can imagine. Especially there, there's some instant and near instant testing on the way. Let's say it takes a couple months to get that up. You could easily imagine if it gets close to instant that everybody coming into a building, let's say an office building, just gets tested in the lobby. Mm -hmm. So you just have a you know, a row of 10 testers, the corporation pays for them, and they just sit in front of their little machines and you come to work in the morning. Maybe you stagger when you start so that, you know, you don't have everybody waiting in line for that. And you just do your test and then you can go into the building and you just can't leave the building. <laughs> and the, and the, next, the next day you come in, you know, because yeah. there's a cafe, cafeteria and bathrooms in there. So the next day you come in and you just test again. So if you had enough tests and they were also instant – you could protect entire like, you know, stadiums and buildings and stuff. All right, but what I expect is that all of these different things are going to be creeping, you know, creeping toward effectiveness over the summer. But at the moment, we don't have a solution that doesn't cost us a million people. Yeah. Meaning, meaning that no matter what we do to go back to work, there's no cure for this thing. So. Whether we get it slowly or quickly, whether we get it so quickly it overwhelms hospitals or not, the same number of people are going to get it eventually. It'll just take a little bit longer for them to get it. And they'll have similar outcomes unless we invent something that changes that and it hasn't happened yet. So the bad news one is that we'll do everything we could possibly do and we're still going to lose a million people. Mm. But uh, as long as the hospitals are not overwhelmed – it's going to be people – I hate – there's no nice way to say it. Yeah, yeah. But it's going to be people who weren't going to live that long and maybe um, your great-grandmother who was 89 and you knew it was only going to be a matter of a year anyway. I hate to say it that people are going to say that's an acceptable risk. But the fact is that would be an acceptable risk statistically. You wouldn't make that risk for your own grandmother, but you're not going to get that choice. Yeah, yeah. Do you think then if if Trump or whoever else would make the decision to open up earlier, 
so that they can, knowing that this is the cause anyways, that this is an in inevitable and the people that are the least risky are the ones that can go back to work to save the economy and the market. Do you think that would be a sound decision? Would you, would you support something like that? Just you know, I, later? I, I think we're beyond the point where there's such a thing as a good decision. Yeah. yeah. Me, meaning, meaning that no matter what the government says it wants to do, they don't have all the votes yeah. because as long as, as long as you have two legs and you can open your door, uh, you're going to go back to work when you're when you decide to go back to work. I mean, obviously your business has to be open and all that, but um, I think the government is well aware that the citizens have a limit to their um, patience. Yeah. And if we and if we can't go back to work after some point, we're going to go after our government. Let Let me just say that as clearly as I can. There is some point, if we can't go back to work, we're going to go after the government. The government mm -hmm. knows that, right? I mean, I'm not saying anything that's revolutionary. If we can't go back to work, we're going for you. You know, we're taking over the government. That's just going to happen. But there's no chance of that because the government, of course, knows that it can't abdicate all responsibility. So we will go back to work. If I had to guess, it's going to be closer to June 1st. Maybe some be, somebody goes back to work in May. It'll mm -hmm. be special cases. But the longer we wait, the more visibility we'll have on these other solutions. We'll have more test kits. We'll have the, the, the serum for the antibodies. We'll have everything. I don't think the vaccinations will be the answer. Because I just uh, it's a long time from now, and I just don't even know if they'll work. Yeah. I mean, I don't, get a, I don't get a flu vaccination now. And it's yeah, not there. I mean, yeah. it, it's just because the odds are so low that it makes any difference at all. I, I can't tell myself to walk across the street. By the way, you should. I, I'm not giving it flu advice. Flu vaccine? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think people should get the flu vaccine, and I think I should get it. It's just I haven't been motivated because the, the, the slight benefit just isn't enough to motivate me. But statistically, sure. you should get it, sure. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, we covered a lot in this conversation, uh, everything from politics to career advice to keeping your sanity during this uh, quarantine. I do want to leave the audience with one actionable advice. We generally do this with all guests where they can provide a small piece of actionable advice or an action that they can do right after listening to this podcast or later throughout this week that will help them go from zero to one, uh, that will help them start the business or reframe their way they're thinking, anything that would be useful for them to take some sort of actionable advice on, what would that be, Scott? Uh, here's my advice. You've got some free time that you wouldn't normally have, some time to, to think, most of us do. And yeah. I would say that if you're thinking about some new direction in your life, if it seems too big, you say, ah, oh, that's a lot, I don't, wanna, I don't know how to start, I can't get into it, take, a, take your first micro step. So a micro step is the smallest thing that you would be willing to actually do. So let's say you're considering a whole new career, but that's just too big. What's the smallest thing you could do? Google it. Just Google it. See what you can learn. Maybe find a phone number of somebody that you'll call later. You don't even have to call them. Just find their phone number. Write it on a note. So take the smallest thing you can do that moves you in that direction and then just do it. And then the day after, maybe you make the call. Maybe you do a little bit deeper. So tell yourself that you can quit at any time. And you're going to do the smallest thing you're going to do. And if a month goes by and you've done a bunch of micro steps, you're going to be surprised. Yeah. You're going to be surprised where you're at. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, I'm going to take that advice. I'm going to put on my workout clothes because I haven't worked out in a while. And uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to follow your advice, Scott. Well, well good. I, I hope I helped. And I hope, I hope those uh, listening to this or, or watching are getting something out of it too. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, check out Scott, guys. Uh, I'll link out all of his books. Uh, is there anything else that you want to, to, to promote during this time? Well, my newest book is called Loser Think. So yeah. that's, that's the one that uh, everybody should see. If, they, if they're arguing on, with people uh, on the internet, it's a must-have. It'll help you do that. It's a great book. It's a great book. Awesome, Scott. Well, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you guys for tuning in. And uh, we've got a lot of great other guests that are coming out in the next few weeks. So stay tuned for that. And uh, we'll see you guys next week.